All right, all right. Man, first and foremost, I want to thank you for coming on the platform. This is a tremendous honor. I truly appreciate everything that you have done um, in terms of your musical uh, contributions. You work with some of the greatest musicians on the earth. So, you know, obviously you one of their peers. You definitely respected by them. Um, you've been in the game for a long time. So thank you so much for taking out your time to, you know, talk to us. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Now, a lot of the stuff you do is behind the scenes. Um, a lot of times as consumers or fans, we take for granted that the soundtracks to our lives, the music, you know, all of the work that goes into the finished product, you know, a lot of times the people behind the scenes, they don't get the flowers that they deserve. So, you know, for those viewers that don't recognize you, um, let them know what your name is and definitely where you're from. My name is Gordon Chambers, and I am from... New York City, born in the Bronx, but have lived in Brooklyn for about 25 years now. And um, this is my 30th anniversary in the industry as a published songwriter. So I'm grateful. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, people have so many dreams, you know, of even um, getting a chance to, to, to meet the artists that you have worked with and wrote songs for and been on songs with, you know, and collaborated with. Um, I kind of want to see, like, um, how was growing up in the in the Bronx influential to you? Because the songs that I know you for, they're mostly like R and B, but you know the Bronx is where hip hop started. So did Bronx. that have a, a major impact on you? The Bronx is right in the heart of hip hop, and um, you know, in the seventies, you know, I grew up in the Bronx. I remember, I remember hearing, you know, the sounds of those block parties at night and scratches. Um, you know, I do remember that, and you know, when we moved to Teaneck, New Jersey, when I was seven. That was one town over away from Inglewood, New Jersey, which was where Sugar Hill Records um, was. Their offices was there. That's the first, you know, Rapper's Delight um, was recorded on on that record label. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of rappers lived in Teaneck, um, performed in 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 in. Um, we had a roller rink that was really famous called the Rink, and they would come and do shows there. So it was right, you know, at that time the seventies, well, really the eighties was. You know, and when I was more of a teenager, you know, I was in a little rap group as a kid. You know, we were kids, you know, and it was what kids were into was 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 hip hop. So the early form of hip hop. But it, as God fate would have it, I mean, some of the first artists that I ended up collaborating with were in the hip hop community. I sang um, sang a f solo feature with um, Naughty by Nature on their Poverty's pa Paradise album. And let the first big star that ever called me into, into the studio to co collaborate was Queen Latifah. And they were part of the Jersey, you know, out of East Orange, out of the Jersey, Newark, and East Orange hip hop scene. So it was a combination of, of hip hop. But when you think about hip hop, I mean, hip hop has always sampled R&B anyway. There's always been a great respect that hip hop had for R&B. So even though I was a sort of an R&B adolescent, people who were into hip hop respected my, you know, the fact that I could get on the piano and play games people play by Curtis Blow by ear, for instance, um, or, you know, that I, that they respected my musicality and, and it was a mutual respect. You know, the hip hop people that I knew, they were cool. They had the it cool factor. I want to be down with their, 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 their heat, their swag. And they wanted to, to be down with my musicality. So it was like a mutual respect thing. You know? Wow. Wow. That's real cool. Um, now you had mentioned playing the piano. Um, yes. Did you get into instruments as a child or is that something you kind of got into later? Were your family musicians or? Yes, I started playing the trumpet when I was seven. And then about a year later, I started playing the piano. But yeah, my parents were very musical, loved to play music, loved to play records, still love music very much. Um, so they were record collectors and they had a lot of house parties where they had all the current, you know, records um, in their collection. And so when we moved to this town, Teaneck, New Jersey, that was offering free public school music lessons, I started with the trumpet first and then I wanted to play the piano. So I started with private piano lessons and my parents supported and nurtured my love of music. They came to every concert, every recital, every music, you know, paid for my private music lessons, but also supported, you know, my, you know, any concerts I had at, all through high school. And, you know, when it was time to go to college, I picked, I didn't go to a music college, but I went to a very artistic school, you know, that I felt would nurture the artist in me, you know, I went to Brown University, you know, even though I was accepted to Princeton with a full scholarship, my father said, 
once I had that conversation with him, I said, Daddy, I think that this is the more school that suits my vibe, my personality. He let me go. That, that was going to definitely cost him and me more money because I had to work, you know, on through campus, two jobs on campus. But, you know, and he had to really, you know, he did, I didn't get a full scholarship. So it cost both of us. But he supported me in being expressing myself, you know, and I'm grateful, forever grateful for that. Man, that's inspiring, man. That lets you know how important a father can be because a lot of people's story is different. They dad like you gotta be a plumber or you gotta be this or yep. that. And you know, for him to not only, you know, have to spend his money, but show you that type of support. That's yep. amazing. And for you to write hit records for like I say, the best artists to travel all around the world. I read you you doing shows in Africa and man, that's that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Now let me see, because I'm I'm currently in Ghana, so I wanted to kind of ask you about oh. that. What was what was that experience like? Are you Ghana? Are you from Ghana? I'm from Cleveland. I'm from Ohio. I'm just visiting, but I'm trying to get my citizenship and buy land, and you know. Um. Yeah. I mean, Africa's amazing. I went to Senegal recently for vacation um, in uh, about a month ago. This is this necklace I have with I got at Goree Island. I mean, going to Africa is amazing. I've I've probably been to Africa maybe 12 times to different parts of Africa. Um, I've been to Ghana, Senegal, Rwanda, um, Morocco, and I've been to South Africa. And I've been all over South Africa up to perform. You know, some of the trips I I was years ago, I went as a journalist because I used to be a, a, the entertainment editor of Essence. You know, when I first got out of college, it was while I was there at Essence was when I first started to, you know, do my freelance songwriting um and you know just as a hobby but while i was still working at essences when my first hit songs actually came out brownstones if you love me anita baker's i apologize missing you um from set it off um with brandy to me and gladys knight chaka khan you know all three of those records were playing on the radio all day while i was still working at my job you know i didn't leave until 1997. but while i was at essence i also got a chance to go to ghana and senegal um, to interview, do some interviews over there. And um, it was amazing. I mean, like going to the motherland makes you understand like your roots, you know, it makes you understand your, the culture, the, the cultural connection, the melanin, the way we walk, the way we talk in certain ways, the, you know, our fashion sense, our swag, you know, you can see the roots of it. You know, you can definitely see it. And, you know, it's, it, it just makes a difference when you don't have to like, you know, have whiteness as your, as your reference point to everything, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. It makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I've been all over Africa as well. I've been to about 20 African countries, but I lived in Johannesburg. I lived in South Africa. And oh, for wow. the viewers, I want to tell them they have a real, real uh, um, wealth of talent down there. They make oh, some yeah. good music. Yeah, yeah. I was in uh, Mabo Nang. Have you been over there? I've been to South Africa four times. I performed in jazz festivals in Soweto twice. Um, but I've also was brought there once to um, coach the American Idol, um, con the, the South African Idol contest. So once I went over there to as a coach, I've been to South Africa, I don't know, four or five times. So I coached there for a week. I was there coaching them. Um, I went to do um, some sort of like marketing stuff for the South Africa tourist boards. So I've been all over South Africa. And then I've vocal coached over the last three, four years, Tyler actually. Um, who's, you know, the multi-platinum, billion stream pride of South Africa. That's, you know, she's been a vocal coaching client and friend, you know, but I've worked with her for the first time in 2021. And we <clears throat> worked together on it off and on during, you know, her different appearances and stuff like that um, for years. So it's um, after going to South Africa to work, South Africa sort of ended up coming to me too, you know? So I have a great love for the craft at South Africa, people can really sing and really respect American R&B. They really have a great love for it. And can sing yeah. in church. You go to South Africa, they gonna, that choir is going to sing for you. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. 
Um, now I can ask you, it's like you're so multi talented. Um, do you have a preference um, as a, you know, being able to play instruments or being able to sing your own songs or writing songs for other people or being a coach or do you love them all equally the same? All. I mean, I really love just being around music as a form of of expression of of of, of connection, of emotion, of vulnerability, but also of confidence. So I love music. Um, like I said, I'm most well known as a songwriter, but I am equally passionate about anything to do with music, whether it be public speaking in a school about music or doing an interview like we're doing about music right now. Um, I've given seminars you know, for the Apollo classes. I did a seminar, a whole seminar on Donny Hathaway, which was more like a, you know, kind of like symposium, you know, more of like an academic type of a of, of undertaking. Um, I have vocal coached artists for 10 years um, for many, many, th I mean, thousands of singers I've worked with, you know, over the years, maybe not thousands, but hundreds um, for sure. Um, thousands of, of sessions of that, you know, and that, that grew out of just going out and performing live and meeting, you know, up and coming singers asking me like, oh, do you coach? I, I think I could take some pointers for you. So that sort of came to me. I mean, over the years of, of, of doing music, I kind of was always open to different things in music. And then things kind of like came to, fell into my lap or came my way. You know what I mean? I, it's not what I was, the thing in music that I was pursuing at the time is not always how the cookie was crumbling. Like when I got very busy as a songwriter in the early nineties, that wasn't really what I was necessarily focusing on. I used to spend a lot of time singing a jazz club, singing jazz, not even singing original music, singing, jazz standards and hanging out with Roy Hargrove, Rest His Peace, and Rodney Kendrick, this um, jazz pianist who was part of Abby Lincoln's band. Those were my friends and I was out in the jazz clubs, you know, trying to be a jazz singer, you know what I mean? But I, I was also writing songs with people and I was just, and I was also doing some acting. You know, I was just, I love the arts. I love to express myself and I love to encourage people expressing themselves. Wow, that's that's definitely inspiring, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, I wanted to ask you about some of the people you collaborated with. Uh, you kind of spoke on it earlier, working with uh, the Queen, the Flavor Unit, uh, Naughty by Nature. Um, now, what was that like, especially working with Queen Latifah to see, you know, she's an icon now, you know what I'm saying, looking back on that. Yeah, I mean, she was an icon then. I mean, this was probably 30 years ago, but she was, you know, she was, she was an icon coming out the gate, so she was... She was who she was even back then, you know. Um, she was very clear on what she wanted, but she gave a lot of, she, she was very clear on what she wanted. She came to me like, I want to do this. Um, I have a sample, but I need to like put some music around the sample. I want to do a song dedicated to my brother. Here's some lyrics I have. Tell me what you hear. So she was very open to my creativity, but she was also like, had a direction, you know, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm open to what you hear and what you're inspired by, by this concept. And then we found the way to, 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 to put it together. I mean, I think that the most, the best leaders are people who are not dictators, but inspirers of, I don't know what's the word, inspirers, the people who inspire creativity and know how to command without demanding, you know? So, but you want to express yourself and you want to be, at your best be around them because you just they're creative too and you want to, to to add to their creativity you want to add yours to theirs and they're open to yours i think that's the best kind of leadership <laughs> 